A lot of investors hold concentrated positions in individual stocks. This can happen when you hear Charlie Munger say, Diversification is for the know-nothing investor. Without realizing that he's talking about you, or for other reasons like being part of a company that went public and holding onto your stock, or owning stock in an employer that has performed so well that it becomes a large part of your portfolio. In any case, I don't think people are aware of how risky individual stocks are. In aggregate, stocks are probably a bit safer for long-term investors than many people think, but individual stocks are way riskier, and interestingly, this is especially true for stocks that have performed well in recent history. I'm Ben Felix, Chief Investment Officer at PWL Capital, and I'm going to tell you why holding a concentrated portfolio of individual stocks is far more likely to lead to catastrophic losses than to life-changing gains. In this video, I'm going to detail just how risky individual stocks are, which is something that I suspect most investors don't appreciate. I'll also cover how many stocks are needed for a portfolio to be diversified, and why it's more than the commonly cited 20 to 30, which is a figure based on outdated research. This is an important topic because it is well documented that individual investors commonly hold portfolios concentrated in somewhere between three and seven stocks, a behavior that is more pronounced for investors who overweight the unlikely probability of a big win relative to the more likely probability of losses. If that's you, you're going to want to hear me out. Individual stocks are exposed to something called idiosyncratic risk. That is risk specific to that company, like what its CEO happens to tweet. And it's a type of risk that does not have a positive expected return. In general, investors should try to avoid idiosyncratic risk by diversifying their portfolios. A broadly diversified portfolio is primarily exposed to market risk, which is a risk with a positive expected return. Diversification reduces risk without reducing expected return, which is why it is referred to as the only free lunch in investing. If diversification is the only free lunch in investing, portfolio concentration is like ordering fugu prepared by an amateur chef. I'll define a concentrated portfolio as a portfolio with a single position that makes up 10% or more of its holdings which is a figure based on one of the papers I'll reference later in the video. Of course, the most concentrated position would be holding one individual stock, and each individual stock after that makes the portfolio more diversified. Concentrated portfolios are problematic because they allow the idiosyncratic risk, the uncompensated or random risk of an individual company to have a meaningful influence on the outcome of the portfolio as a whole. That might not be so bad if most individual stocks performed really well, but the data on individual stock returns are sobering. JP Morgan puts out an occasionally updated report called The Agony and the Ecstasy that details the range of outcomes for individual stock returns. In the 2021 issue, one of the data points that jumps out at me is the frequency of catastrophic losses, defined as a 70% decline in price from peak to trough, which is never recovered from. 44% of the companies that appeared in the Russell 3000 Index, an index representing the U.S. stock market from 1980 through 2020, experienced a catastrophic loss. Some sectors like energy and information technology had even higher frequencies of catastrophic losses. Let me make sure that's clear because it is staggering. 44% of the stocks that appeared in the Russell 3000 index over this period experienced losses of 70% or more that were never recovered from. This shouldn't be too surprising. Capital markets are highly competitive and they're driven by creative destruction. Some companies succeed to the point that they displace companies that had previously been successful, and some companies fail or at least struggle to compete. In aggregate, stock returns are positive, but within those positive returns are lots of losers. Evidence of this is the fact that despite the incredible performance of the S&P 500 index as a whole, hundreds of companies have been removed from the index over time due to business distress. The other issue is that there are more losers than there are winners. Over the 1980 to 2020 period, 42% of stocks included in the Russell 3000 had negative absolute returns. They lost money. 66% trailed the market, and 10% did beat the market by a cumulative 500% or more over the full period. They're deemed mega winners. That is called positive skewness. Most stocks perform poorly, but a few do exceptionally well. Many of the investors holding individual stocks are overweighting the probability of holding a mega winner. Some sectors are worse for skewness than others. 84% of stocks in the energy sector trailed the market over this period, 85% in utilities, and 73% in information technology. All of those sectors did still have some big winners, though. Looking at the distribution of individual stock returns from 1980 to 2020 visually, 
we see that most stocks underperform the market while a relatively small portion of them match or beat the market, and a few do exceptionally well. Intuitively, this positively skewed distribution means that if you're selecting a small number of individual stocks for a long-term portfolio, it's much more likely that you will pick stocks that underperform the market than stocks that outperform. This is one of the reasons that diversification makes sense in general, and why total market index funds in particular, which hold all the stocks in the market, are really hard to beat. That intuition is detailed in the 2017 paper, Why Indexing Works, which shows using a simple model that when the distribution of returns is positively skewed, randomly selecting a subset of securities from the index may dramatically increase the chance of underperforming the index. This simple model is validated empirically in the 2023 paper, Mutual Fund Performance at Long Horizons, which finds that the pre-fee returns of only 45.2% of actively managed U.S. equity mutual funds in the U.S., beat the net of fee returns of SPY, an S&P 500 ETF, over their sample period. This shows that due to the skewness in stock returns, active management, which tends to hold more concentrated portfolios than the market index, is at a disadvantage even before fees and costs are considered. Those actively managed fund portfolios, while less diversified than the market, are much more diversified than many individual investors. One of the reasons for this is likely that investors holding individual stocks think that they know the companies that they own and understand the risks and opportunities that they represent. I think this speaks to the familiarity bias where investors are more comfortable with what they know and the illusion of control bias where investors feel like they have some level of control over the outcome of their individual stock holdings due to their knowledge of the company or research they've done about investing in it. But the reality is that the factors that drive underperformance and catastrophic losses are unpredictable. For example, the JP Morgan study discusses how things like commodity price risks that can't be hedged away changes in government policy, deregulation and re-regulation of industries, foreign competition, trade policy, and fraud by company employees are some of the unpredictable things that have caused past business failures. These are things that no matter how well a business is run or how well you understand it, can blindside its profitability leading to a significant stock price decline or total company collapse. These declines can happen quickly and unexpectedly. The 2024 issue of The Agony and the Ecstasy shows a sample of companies that experienced catastrophic losses with the magnitude of the loss on the y-axis and the maximum monthly rate of decline on the x-axis. The size of the dots indicate the market capitalization of the company after its decline. We see that many companies of different sizes have experienced huge losses that accumulate quickly. I think it's common for investors to want to hold on to their losing individual stock positions until after they have recovered, known as the disposition effect but in many cases they will continue to decline or will simply never recover to their previous high. It's easy to believe that catastrophic losses can only happen to companies with weak financials, high valuations, or within certain sectors, but they happen across sectors to profitable companies, to companies with moderate debt ratios, and to companies with reasonable valuations. Any business, even a well-run and successful one, can suffer a catastrophic loss. Another data point that investors may use to evaluate whether a catastrophic loss can happen to their stock is analyst consensus on whether the stock is a buy or a sell. Maybe if you only hold on to stocks that analysts rate as a buy, you're safe. Incredibly, the vast majority of catastrophic losers in this sample were consensus buys or strong buys prior to their declines. Going back further in time than the JP Morgan study and extending the stocks beyond the Russell 3000 index, the 2018 study Do Stocks Outperform Treasury Bills looks at all U.S. stocks that existed in the Center for Research and Security Prices, or CRISP, database from 1927 through 2016, and finds overall similar results to the previously mentioned study. Only 42.6% of common stocks have a lifetime buy-and-hold return that exceeds the return to holding one-month treasury bills. This means that more than half of the time, you are better off holding risk-free treasury bills than individual stocks. Only 30.8% of stocks in the sample beat the value-weighted market index, which is what a total market index fund represents over their lifetimes, a figure similar to the JP Morgan study. And more than half of the stocks in the sample deliver negative lifetime returns. This figure is likely worse than the JP Morgan study due to the fact that the sample includes all stocks, including tiny ones, rather than being cut off at the top 3,000 in the Russell 3000 index. And it extends to the lifetime of stocks rather than the 1980 to 2020 sample period. The data are slightly better at the 10-year horizon with 49.5% of stocks beating treasury bills, and 37.3% beating the market, but these are still abysmal numbers, reinforcing the extreme risk of owning individual stocks. Again, most individual stocks are losers, and some win big. 
For what it's worth, the author of Do Stocks Outperform Treasury Bills has also co-authored a similar paper looking at global stock returns and found the skewness to be even more extreme. The 2023 study, Underperformance of Concentrated Stock Positions, uses a set of all U.S. stocks excluding the smallest stocks from 1926 through 2022, similar to the Russell 3000 Index, to detail the effects of concentrated positions in individual stocks on portfolio performance. The author finds that the median 10-year U.S. single stock return in this sample is a cumulative negative 7.9 percentage points relative to the capitalization-weighted market portfolio, or an annualized 0.82 percentage points in underperformance, and that 55% of individual stocks trail the market at the decade horizon. The author also shows how the volatility of a portfolio changes with an increasing weight in a concentrated position by modeling various portfolios consisting of the market index and an increasing allocation to an individual stock. Portfolio volatility is relatively unaffected by single positions at weights up to 10%, and increasingly affected thereafter. The effects are more pronounced for individual stocks with higher idiosyncratic volatility. This is where my earlier suggestion that a position is concentrated when it makes up 10% or more of a portfolio comes from. If you hear all this and think that nobody would buy a loser stock since smart investors only pick winners, the crazy thing from this paper is that stocks with top 20% performance over the last five years have a median cumulative return over the following 10 years of negative 17.8 percentage points relative to the market underperforming by an annualized 1.94 percentage points, and 60% of these stocks trail the market. Observed underperformance of the median stock in the study applies across all industry groups and among both the smallest and largest stocks in the sample. There are a few important takeaways from these studies on individual stock returns. Positive skewness in individual stock returns means that you're much more likely to pick a loser than a winner when selecting an individual stock. And the effects of skewness are more extreme at longer horizons. This means that the chances of being a successful long-term buy-and-hold investor with only a few stocks is increasingly unlikely at longer horizons. Though if you do pick the rare winners, the results can be extremely positive. Underperformance can happen quickly, unexpectedly, and irreversibly. Many stocks not only underperform the market, but suffer catastrophic losses that they do not recover from. To be clear, it is true that a small number of stocks perform exceptionally well. It's just hard to pick them before the fact. Past winners are more likely to underperform than outperform in the future. Given the extreme risk and positive skewness of individual stock returns, some level of diversification is likely sensible. But how much is less clear? Research from the 1970s and 80s found that a portfolio of 20 to 40 stocks is sufficient for diversification because beyond that point, the risk reduction benefits diminish. This finding has colored the beliefs of many investors, but it has a problem. It assumes that volatility is the only measure of risk that matters to investors. I'd argue that what really matters is the expected distribution of long-term wealth outcomes. For example, a more concentrated portfolio has a small chance of holding the mega winner and a much larger chance of holding losers. The difference in wealth accumulation between the worst and best concentrated portfolios is going to be enormous at long horizons. Reducing volatility is a good thing, but even small differences in volatilities can have big impacts on long-term wealth outcomes. A 2022 study, How Many Stocks Should You Own?, simulates long-term wealth multiples for portfolios with varying levels of concentration. The authors find that the 25th and 10th percentile outcomes, the worst outcomes, improve dramatically until around 250 stocks are included, and the incremental benefits of diversification decrease thereafter. The average portfolio in their simulations multiplied wealth 19 times on average over 25 years. But an investor with just 25 stocks had a 1 in 10 chance of receiving less than a 12 times wealth multiple, while an investor with 250 stocks had a 1 in 10 chance of achieving less than a 17 times multiple of wealth. Again, the distribution of returns is tighter for a more diversified portfolio, meaning that the worst outcome is less bad and the best outcome is less good relative to a more concentrated portfolio. This makes the choice about how diversified a portfolio should be a preference more than a prescription. But I do think it's important to highlight that when risk is measured as the variability of terminal wealth, the diversification benefits of adding more stocks continues far beyond 20 to 30 holdings. If you are confident that you can pick winning stocks before the fact, portfolio concentration can make sense, but the odds are stacked against you, and the track record of active management in general leaves much to be desired.
Some investors may be comfortable with that risk. They may be willing to accept a wider range of long-term outcomes, including a good chance of trailing the market or suffering a catastrophic loss in exchange for a smaller chance at extreme outperformance. This is a preference for a lottery-like payoff, which is fine, but it's a risk that needs to be properly understood. In Do Stocks Outperform Treasury Bills, the author simulates long-term returns for 20,000 randomly selected 5, 25, 50, and 100 stock portfolios. He finds at the 10-year horizon that even 100 stock portfolios outperform the market only 47.5% of the time. There are different ways to interpret that result. One way is that, hey, it was only a little worse than a coin flip that you would have beaten the market before costs. The other is that you had more than a 50% chance of trailing the market. The nice thing about total market index funds is that you know you're going to get the market return, even if you don't know what that return is going to be. With a more concentrated portfolio, you're going to get the market return plus or minus the active return from portfolio concentration. The range of outcomes for that active return will be larger with increasing portfolio concentration, and the distribution of outcomes will have lots of losing portfolios and a few big winners. Research from Vanguard shows that fund active share, which is not the same thing as concentration but is related, results in a wider dispersion of benchmark relative returns for actively managed portfolios. It really becomes a question of how confident you are that the stocks you pick will be winners rather than losers, while keeping in mind that the distribution of individual stock returns is kind of scary. Another important consideration here is that portfolio concentration may have asymmetric effects on performance. The 2022 paper, Fund Concentration, a Magnifier of Manager Skill, finds that increasing concentration has a pronounced positive impact on performance for outperforming funds, but the opposite is true for underperforming funds, and importantly, higher levels of concentration generally hurt the poorly performing funds more than it helps the outperforming funds. If you are currently holding concentrated positions in single stocks, there are some economic and psychological barriers to diversify. The biggest economic barrier is typically taxes. If you own a stock that increases in value substantially, leading to concentration in that position, there could be a large tax bill associated with selling it. In that case, it's important to consider that the taxes generally don't go away. The only thing you control is whether you pay them now or later. Deferring taxes can be a good thing, but in this case, it's being traded off against taking a large amount of idiosyncratic risk. There are other strategies like tax efficiently donating the appreciated securities that can make sense, but this decision should be approached carefully. Another less common economic constraint is control. Some large shareholders may need to maintain their position in order to maintain voting control of the company. The psychological constraints include the representativeness bias, where people ignore the types of base rate probabilities that I've discussed in this video and assume that their past experience with a single stock is indicative of its expected range of future outcomes. The endowment effect, where people prefer things that they already own. The status quo bias, to stick with the thing that they're already doing. And in the case of a stock that has fallen in price, the disposition effect. Managing these biases with respect to diversifying a single stock position can be challenging, but I've seen a couple of things that can help. One is imagining that the amount you have invested in the stock is in cash and asking yourself if you would buy the stock today with that cash. Another is creating a systematic plan to dollar cost average out of the concentrated position, avoiding the psychological impact of one big decision. Individual stocks are extremely risky. Most of them underperform the market, many of them have negative long-term returns or catastrophic losses, and a small number of them have extremely high returns. Picking any one stock is more likely to lead to a bad outcome than a good one, and counterintuitively, this is even more pronounced for stocks that have performed well over the last five years. The simple answer to overcoming individual stock risk is diversification. The extent of diversification that makes sense depends on your preferences for skewness, your conviction in your stock selection ability, and your willingness to bear the risk of a wider range of potential outcomes. Getting out of a single stock position can have economic and psychological challenges, but these can be overcome with thoughtful planning. Thanks for watching. I'm Ben Felix, Chief Investment Officer at PWL Capital. Tell me about your single stock positions in the comments.